If someone tells you, hey, I've got some new Antheas, your next question is likely to be, what kind you get? Without knowing specifically the species, it's hard to envision the fish or even offer some suggestions about care. Antheas is a very generic term, and so it's important to know what we're actually talking about by using at least the common name, or better yet, the proper species name. After all, common names can be reused and different depending on the part of the world that you're in. That said, even actual honest-to-goodness scientific taxonomy can be a messy place. As we learn about new things in the world and gain new tricks like x-rays and genetics, well, we go back and we reorganize animals into better, more thought-through groups. In the future, they'll be reorganized yet again. It's all part of how science works, building on the work of others that came before. Hi guys and girls, I'm Reef Man, and today we are talking about newly published research reorganizing the taxonomy of some of our hobby's favorite reef tank fish, the antheas. If you're interested in all of the nitty gritty details, you can check out the paper by Anthony Gill of the University of Sydney, which I've linked down below in the description. Now, antheas are all included in the subfamily Anthidinae, and that includes over 220 species of fish from tropical waters all across the globe. Now, under that subfamily, you've probably heard of the genus Pseudantheus. That was described way back in 1871. That's what we, somewhat incorrectly, refer to when we talk just generically about Antheus. Our fish stores often use it interchangeably as the genus for almost all of the aquarium Antheas. Now, that's been a problem in the past, of course, but with this new research, it's even more of a problem as some people will use the new names, others are gonna use the old names, and search results on forums like Reef to Reef everywhere will become fragmented over time. Hopefully we can change that though, and today we'll go through at least some of the reorganization that's been going on. We'll go over two reworked genera, Microlabicthus and Nemantheus, and we'll introduce a new genus called Pyronotantheus. We'll also learn a lot about antheas and fish morphology more generally along the way. Now this data is hot off the presses, only published in Zootaxa on January 18th of 2022 when I'm recording this video, so we'll have to work on spreading this news to get vendors and websites updated. Okay, so Mirolebictus. This was originally defined as a subgenus under Pseudantheus, but with this new work it's elevated to its own genus. In doing so, this genus was reduced to only include three species, M. tuca, M. pascalis, and my personal favorite of all the antheas, M. Mivansi, which you're seeing throughout this video. I recently bought a group of six of these incredible fish, and I've been busy feeding them just small amounts of all the food that I can find every couple hours, trying to get them uh, well-fed and eating pellets. The fish in Mirolab ichthys have extra scales, called auxiliary scales, over most of their body. And that, along with the distinctive dorsal fin shape, identifies them from other genera. If we look at the photo of just one of these fish, you can see that their dorsal fin is longer the further back it gets. Now, that's specifically between the fourth and tenth spines in their dorsal fin. This is also most obvious on adult males, and my tank has only females at this point, so if you're looking at the video, it's harder to see in the videos that I'm showing. Another tool that you can use to identify male antheas, and particularly males in the lab micro lab ichthys genus, is the front of their upper lip often extends beyond their mouth, almost making it look like they've got a beak of sorts. Females of the same species will not have this feature, and so if all else fails, you can look for that. I don't think this feature is totally exclusive to Mirolabictus antheas as well, so keep that in mind if you're looking at antheas more generally and one of them seems to have a beak. So that brings us to Nemantheas. This is a genus of antheas that is easily distinguished by a feature called out in their common name, which is the thread fin antheas. They get this name from the distinctive spines in the front of their dorsal fins that males of this genus often display. Nemantheas is also now expanded to include several species that you're probably familiar with, N. carberii, N. bartlettorum, N. bicolor, N. dispar, and Ignitus and N. regalis. Nemantheas, particularly N. bartlettorum and N. bicolor, are probably amongst the most commonly kept antheas in our reef tanks. And that's for a very good reason, too. 
Those are probably the most adaptable and easily kept of all of the Antheas. These two species would be a good place to start if you're interested in Antheas, but you don't want to undertake the more fragile species right away. Nymantheas can be identified by a dorsal fin that starts above or slightly behind the back edge of the opercle. That's the group of bones over and just behind a fish's gills. And you can see it pretty well on my blue spotted angelfish here. Additionally, as I mentioned, males of this genus have those raised spines in the front of their dorsal fins. They also have a high number of a very specific kind of scale, a circumpenduncle scale, which are the scales found around the base of their tails. Antheas from Mirolab ichthys have between 25 and 28 circumpenduncle scales. Nemantheas, on the other hand, have between 29 and 36, depending on the species. Of all of the antheas the paper gave data for, nemantheas as a group have the highest number of those scales. Now, of course, as hobbyists without a really good photo, one of these fish, or a good photo of one of these fish, it's nearly impossible to count those tiny scales like this. They're, they're just too small. And so that brings us to the final group, the new genus of Pyronodantheus. Now, this is a brand new genus with Pyronodantheus lori as the type species. This is a genus easily identifiable with just our eyes. It has a red or maybe an orange stripe or blotches below the back part of their dorsal fin. In fact, that is what the new genus's name is all about. Pyro is Greek for fire, nada is Greek for back, and of course we're familiar with antheas. Pyronodantheus contains species you might be familiar with, though they're a lot less common in the hobby as compared to some of the nemantheas that we talked about earlier. You may have heard of P. bimarginatus, P. flavogatatus, or P. lori, uh, but those are only three of the five additional species that are in that genus now. There is much work left to be done to better organize the antheas. Work like we've been seeing done with the fairy wrasses, finding clades or groups of related species, things like that. This is ongoing work, and I bet we'll see more from the same author on this. Clades are particularly interesting to me, because if one species is closely related to another and in the same clade, then I think that means usually for us as hobbyists at least, they probably have similar care requirements. Though we as hobbyists can't see it, the gill arches, and that's the bones that are under and support a fish's gills, they're also different and distinctive in their structure for those new genuses and the reorganized genuses that we talked about. And that could be a feature that is used to further organize these fish in the future. Despite their popularity, antheas are very fragile fish, requiring careful care and frequent feeding. Some of them, like N. bartlettorum, are much more forgiving than others, like M. Evansi. Evansi antheas themselves are comparatively easy to care for versus some even more fragile species like M. tuca. Others fall somewhere in between, but all of them need frequent feedings and take time to train to learn to eat pellets. They're also very hard to quarantine. They're very touchy. And for that reason, I'd recommend reaching out to a company like Ocean Devotion to buy a quarantined fish if you're seriously interested in getting a group of antheas. After all, why do all that work yourself? You can pay a little bit extra and let them do that very hard part of keeping antheas for you. I'd also like to remind you that antheas have been successfully bred in captivity. It is doable. I'll link to a video above for you if you want to check that out. It does take a special setup, but there's nothing too difficult about it, and it would be amazing to see captive bred antheas available in the hobby sometime soon. I hope you liked the video. If you did, leave a comment and make sure you're subscribed to the channel and you get more like it. I hope you've been safe, particularly to my viewers in Ukraine. The analytics say there are a few of you, and remember to be kind to each other. That's it. Have a fantastic day. Bye.